Hello everyone, and welcome to a screencast about game development in Clojure. My name is James Trunk, and I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour of what it's like to develop a game using PlayCLJ inside of Lighttable. To get the most out of this screencast, I recommend that you're already familiar with Clojure, and that's because I'm going to be focusing on the library and not on the language. So what is PlayCLJ? Well, let's take a look at its GitHub project page. And here's the introduction. It's a closure library that provides a wrapper for libgdx, allowing you to write 2D and 3D games that run on desktop and mobile OSs. libgdx, it's a mature, fast, and cross-platform Java games library, and this wraps it in a nice closure interface. And it's created by a guy called Zach Oakes, who's a prolific and talented closure developer, and he's given a great justification as to why it's interesting to program games using closure and play CLJ, so I'm not going to go over that myself, I'll let you read that. Uh, and also because I want to uh, justify, if you like, how cool it is to develop with this by showing you it rather than telling you about it. When you first come here, I'd highly recommend checking out the tutorial and the example games. Uh, Zach has written a fantastic in-depth tutorial that takes you from zero to the point where you're moving a sprite around the screen. And then the games show you how you can create 2D platform games, isometric games, uh, games that have box 2D physics. So they're a great way to learn the framework. But if these are so good, why am I doing a screencast about it? Well, that's a good question. But if you're anything like me, you found that there's a bit of a jump between getting to the point at the end of the tutorial where you can move a sprite around the screen all the way to the point where you've got a fully formed game that has quite complex game logic. So I'm hoping that this screencast will be a stepping stone between the two. So feel free to do the tutorial first and then try and follow along with the live coding that I'm going to be doing here. Okay, so let's get started then. So we'll create a new line in a project. Oh, let's first into our projects directory. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so let's do a line new play CLJ project and we'll give it the name Apples because we're going to be making a super simple game about picking up apples. So that will download the dependencies, create the structure, and then we can hop over to light table and pull that straight in. James Trunk Projects Apples. There we go. So we upload that. And here's the, the default structure you get with a Play CLJ project. You get three top-level folders, Android, Desktop, and iOS. And today we're going to be spending all our time in the Desktop folder. So we're not going to get as far as deploying to iOS or Android. And the Desktop folder has two source trees one called source and one called source common. So source common has the core CLJ file, which is where your main game code is going to live. And source, uh, just plain source, has a desktop launcher. So this is specific to the desktop version of the game. And this core is common for all of, all of the versions if you're deploying to mobile OSs, etc. OK, so what we're going to do is I'm going to start a Pomodoro here and see how far we can get within just 25 minutes. So let's kick that off. Okay, so what do we have here? Well, we have two macros, one that's called def game and one that's called def screen. Def game is what gets called on launching the game, and it's a function that takes a game and it sets the screen. So, what is a screen? A game is kind of easy to understand. You have one of them, it is the game. But what is a screen? That's a little bit trickier. A screen is a collection of game entities and their behaviors. And you have a, a number of different functions that you can use to manipulate those in different situations. A little bit hard to explain, but what we're going to do is hop in straight away and start coding, and hopefully it's going to become clearer. So let's talk a little bit about what we have. So we have two functions here, an onShow function, which takes screen and entities, and an onRender, which also takes the same pair of arguments. So screen is a set of useful settings, you could say, for the, that, that particular screen, and entities is your game state. All it is is a vector of closure records. Uh, but from now on, they're records for performance reasons. But from now on, I'm just going to refer to them as maps uh, because we're always going to be dealing with them as, as if they're a map. Because as you probably know, the underlying uh, implementation in closure of a record is a map. So we're going to call this entities or the game state. It's a vector of maps. OK, and then this, this initial game that's created, it's just a Hello World game that uses the UI namespace to put up a label that just says Hello World in the bottom corner. But I'm not going to launch that. In the interest of time, we're going to hop straight in and grab my game resources. So they are here. 
So we have an apple, an apple orchard, and a cow. We'll copy that, go back to projects, and we need to put those under desktop resources so that player CLJ can find them when we want to load them in. And then we're going to switch out. We're not going to use the, the UI namespace. We're going to use the 2D namespace, which is called G2D. And we'll get rid of this bit on the on show that puts the label on, and we'll start loading in our graphics. So we'll call the background background and we'll use a function called texture which you pass one parameter which is the path to the texture and what was the name of the background apple orchard apple underscore orchard dot png and by default so what texture does is it loads this and it stores it in a record so this is going to be a record or a map as I said we'll call it a map and by default where when uh, PlayCLJ has a texture record it uh, renders it in its default size, which in this case is 1500 pixels by 750 pixels at 0, 0, which is the bottom left of the screen. And that's fine for the background, that's exactly what we want to do. But if we want to render the player, which is this cow here, 800 by 700 pixels, we can also pull in the texture, cow.png. But here what we're going to want to do is manipulate where we place it and the size of it. And we can do that. Like I said, it's a record, but we're going to treat it like a map. So we can just do an ASOC, and then we can associate the updated key values that we're interested in. So instead of putting it at x0, we're going to bring it off the side of the screen a little bit by 50 pixels. We're also going to bring it off the bottom by 50 pixels. And how big was it? 800 by 700. That's a bit too big for the size of our... Uh, orchard, so we're going to halve the size. So we're going to set the width to 400 and the height to 350. That should work. Now, the on show function, this gets called once. It gets called when dev screen is first initiated. So this is how you set up the initial state of your game. Whereas the on render function, this function is being called every frame. So if your game is running at 60 frames a second, this function is going to be called 60 times. And each of these uh, functions, you pass in the screen and the entities, and what it's expecting you to return is a new set of entities manipulated on what you want to happen in that particular function. So in this case, we've done a let, and we've created a background and a player. And we can basically ignore the fact that we've got entities passed in, because we know at the start of the game that that's going to be empty. And we can just say, we're going to return you a new vector that just has the background and the player. And the order that they appear in the vector is also the order that they are rendered. So this will render the background first and the player on top of the background, which is exactly what we want. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and evaluate this code so we can connect the light table to the, the end REPL. And then we need to think about how we're going to launch this game. Well, we have this desktop launcher namespace which has a main method. So we're going to want to call that method, but let's first change the size of the window of the game to match the size of our background and save that. And one way we can do it, now we're connected to the Apple snapshot, so one way to do it is if we launch an Insta Apple, we can turn off the live mode and we can switch by using use to the desktop launcher namespace. So let's grab that. And once we're in there we can just call the main method. Okay, so let's see if that launches our game. It did, but it didn't didn't uh, take into account that I changed the size. I wonder why that is. Um, I think it's, oh, it's because it's running from the REPL and I saved the file but I didn't reevaluate it. So let's quickly quit that. Let's go to here and let's reevaluate that file. Now I have to, when you close the game, it disconnects you from the REPL, it actually shuts down that REPL instance. Um, so normally when you're developing uh, with PlayCLJ inside of Lighttable or if you're using uh, Nightcode, then you just launch the game once and all of your changes are done by REPL editing, which is super powerful. Uh, okay, so now I've evaluated that. Now if we go back here, hopefully this time it should be the right size. Let's take a look. It is... But hello world is there. Let's see. Is that because now I haven't <laughs> evaluated this one? So now both files are saved. 
Hopefully both files are evaluated and hopefully we're going to see the cow and the background on the right sized. So let's look. Use main. Voila, finally we have exactly what we need. So there's our cow, there's the background. It doesn't do much right now. So let's add some functionality for moving the cow around. So how can we do that? Well, PlaySeoJ comes with a built-in screen function that's called on key. No, it's not on key press. I think it's called on key down, which again takes the same two parameters, screen and entities. And again, it's expecting you to return a list of modified entities. So what can we do here? Well, we need to figure out which key that the the player has pushed. So we can do a cond and then figure out if they've pushed, and in this case we want to move the cow left and right when they push the left or the right arrow key. So we can write a little helper method up here that says, uh, what should we call it, get, get direction maybe we can call it, doesn't need to take any arguments, and then this can have a condition and we can, there's a uh, there's a function in PlaySeoJ called isPress that checks whether or not a particular key has been pressed and that takes a closure keyword and I happen to know that the arrow key is called dpad left so it, when they push dpad left then we want to return the direction left and if they've pressed dpad right then we want to return the, dir the direction right Okay, so that will return which direction they've pushed. So if they've pushed either of those, then that won't be nil. So we can just use get direction to figure out if they've pushed either of those. And in that case, we want to move the player. So we need a new function, and that's going to take the entities. Because we're going to, like I said, whenever you're in one of these functions, you always take in an entities as the parameters, this list of, or vector of maps. And you always want to return a newly updated one of those. Okay, but we should also put in uh, the else condition. So if they've pushed another key that we're not interested in, we don't want the game to crash with a null pointer, we can just return the entities unchanged. Okay, on key down, on render. Now we need to write the move player function. So let's quickly def n move player, and that's going to take the entities. And because entities is just a vector of maps, we have all of the uh, closures wonderful sequence library at our disposal so we can just do a straight map over the list of entities and what are we going to do well, I suppose we want to update the player position so let's, let's create a new function called update player position and that one will just take a single entity we'll map that over entities so this function is just going to take a single entity and return an updated version of it. So update player position. This time we just take a single entity. Okay, so how do we actually update the position? Well, the first thing we want to do is figure out what direction have they pushed. So then we can figure out if we need to add or subtract pixels. Uh, so we, we already have a function for doing that. So we can just call get direction and that will say whether it was left or right. And then we need to figure out what the new x position is for the player or the cow. So now we know the direction. So if we do a case based on the direction, so we can say, what do we do if it's left? Now let's start with right. So if it's right, we're going to want to add pixels. We want to move it further across to this side of the screen. So we want to add pixels to the x. So if we grab the, the current x position out of the entity by just doing a straight map lookup, and let's add 10 pixels, let's say, to the right when they push right. Okay, and what about if they push left? Exactly the same thing, but instead of adding, this time we're going to take away. Also 10. Uh, I think what I'm going to do here, actually, when I see two numbers like that that are the same, and I know that they're linked, it screams at me that that's a magic number. So let's let's define, so should we call it speed? Yeah, that's good enough. Let's define speed and that way we just need to change it in one place and those two will always be linked. That feels good. Okay, so we have a direction, we have a new X position. So now all we need to do is update the map. And like I said before, we can just use the straight map functions on that. So we do it in a sock on the entity and we tell it that its new X value is the new X. Okay, so we're mapping over all of the entities. And this is one thing that I should probably show you. If we look down here in the tutorial, uh, using the REPL, 
The next thing to try and do is reading and modifying the state. You can actually read the state by doing a, a deref of the entities in the main screen. So let's do that. Main screen entities deref. So what do we have right now? Like I said, it was just a vector, and we have two records. But again, ignore the fact that it's a record. Just concentrate on the map bit. So we have a texture entity and a texture entity, which has the first one is just the texture object. That's the background. And this one is the player, which has a height, a width an X and a Y. Um, but we don't want to move the background, we just want to move the player. So how are we going to do that? We need to, because right now we're mapping this function over all of the entities, so this would actually move both, oops, this would actually move both the player and the background. Do not want to do that. So one thing we could do is let's do some, let's do some destructuring. Closure comes with some wonderful destructuring tools, so let's use keys and let's grab out uh, how can we do this? I mean, this one has an X value and this one doesn't, but that feels a bit a bit clanky to do it that way. So what we'll do is we'll add a new key value pair. Let's say, let's give it a Boolean value that says player true. And then we can just pull that one out, that key out, if I could type. And then we still need to refer to the entity as well. Uh, yeah, so let's grab the player out, and then once we've done that, we can just do if player, then we want to do this. And if it's not a player, then we just want to return the entity unchanged. This is a common pattern that you're going to see again and again in, in the helper functions. Uh, when, when you have something that you want to change, you change it, otherwise you just pass it through. Because like I said, we always want to return the entire list of entities at the end of each uh, each of these functions. Okay, so update player position. I think we have everything. One other thing to mention here, if we go back to this, this using the REPL in the tutorial, it says here that uh, first switch the REPL into the right namespace and then type the following command which runs the set screen function on the render thread, thread in order to restart main screen. When you add new functions to a dev screen, because of how it's implemented under the under the skin as a macro, uh, when we add new ones here, we actually need, we can't just do an eval because then we're using the existing version of the macro, the first evaluated one. What we actually need to do is force uh, PlayCLJ to, to update it and update it in the render thread. And we do that by running this command. We say to the app, run this anonymous function and then do the set screen hello world. So set screen is what we do in the beginning of the game to sort of launch into a particular screen. And this says just reset that screen. So let's do that quickly. Hello world, main screen, post runnable. Okay, so let's run that. Let's eval all the code. Unable to resolve symbol, hello world, of course, because I just copied and pasted and my game is not called hello world, it's called apples. Let's try that again. Okay, that looks like it worked. Anything else we should do? Yeah, one more thing, as well as uh, it's, it's also useful to be able to run this from within inside the game, uh, just so we can keep the game up and see things changing. So what we could do is add another condition here and say if the user pushes the R key for reset, then we can also run that code. Let's just run that one more time to unable to roll, <laughs> same mistake again apples. Ah, but here this probably isn't going to work because it's referring to apples which is defined after and it's referring to main screen which is itself. So let's do closure copes with that by doing a declare. So let's do a declare apples and main screen. Let's try that. Yeah, everything looks like it compiles. Great. So we go back to the game, do we have a cow that moves? We do, look, we can go right and left. It's kind of a moonwalking cow right now, uh, which isn't necessarily exactly what we want. So let's figure out how we can flip the cow around when we push the opposite direction. So when we go right, we want it to be that way. And when we push left, if we're facing right, we want it to switch over. One way to do that would be to add a direction key value pair. And to start with, when we when we're on the on show, when we start the game, we know that the cow's facing right. And then in here, instead of just doing a sock straight away, we can do a check on whether the direction of the player is still the same 
as the one that they've uh, the new direction that we've calculated here. So if we do a when not equal and let's grab the current direction out of the player from the entity and compare it to the direction that we've just calculated. So when they're not equal, then we should do a flip. So how do we do that? Well, we, uh, PlaceLJ has a texture function with an exclamation mark that says, instead of creating a new texture, update the settings of an existing texture. So in this case, we can give it the flip uh, method, which is a method in the underlying Java library. And that takes two Boolean parameters, one for flipping the horizontal, which we do want to do, and one for flipping the vertical, which we don't want to do. So we say texture entity flip it true false when they're different. And that's good. And we're also going to have to add that direction to our player. So we've added it in the beginning and then we, we can get rid of that. I don't think we need that anymore now that we have it in the R key. Okay, so let's evaluate all of those. Let's go back to the game. Let's push R to reset. So if we go right, it goes right. And if we go left, it flips. Great, so we have a cow moving around. Maybe it's moving a little bit slowly. So let's go here and let's try bringing the speed up to say 20. How's that? Oh, maybe a bit too fast. Don't want our cow to be superhuman. Let's bring that down to 14. Yeah, that feels okay. But you see there that the advantage of record-based development, you tweak a value, you just flip back to the game and it's automatically changed. Really, really nice. Okay, so what next? Now we want to start now we want to start spawning some apples that the cow can pick up. So let's write a helper method called spawn apple. And that's not going to take any parameters. And what do we want to do? So we want the apples to spawn along the path that the cow walks along. So let's, let's create some random x and y values for each apple. So the x is going to be, we want, don't want them to appear here. So let's push it off the edge a bit by say 50 pixels. And let's do a random int. All the way it was 1500 to here so let's bring it in a bit to say 1400 so that will give us a random integer in the range of 50 to 1450 it seems about right and for y again we want it to be 50 so it's in line with the cow and then round in not too much random spread on the y maybe just should we try 30 pixels okay so now we have an x and a y so then all we need to do is associate so what are we going to do? We are going to associate the, um, the new texture, of course. We need to load in the Apple texture. So it's called Apple PNG, and it's 100 by 130 pixels. So if we associate the texture, apple.png, with that x and the y value that we've just calculated, and do we want it to be that big? Now let's let's do what we did with the cow and let's halve it. So let's make it 50 by 65. Okay, so now we that would should spawn us an apple randomly along that line. Great. But how do we call that? We want a timer that's going to um, call that for us. Luckily, PlayCLJ has exposed the timer functionality that you get with, with underlying in libclj, uh, libgdx. Sorry. So we can just call an add timer. And we need to give it a, the screen that we want to add the timer for. We need to give it a timer ID. So let's just give it the same name as our function, spawn apple. And then we need to give it how uh, long do we wait before we first trigger the timer. So let's just wait one second. And then the second parameter is how often should you wait in between spawning the timer again. So we'll spawn the first apple after one second. And then we'll keep spawning apples every two seconds. But now we need to add a new on the timer function down here in the screen that actually does something when that timer triggers. So again, it takes the screen, again, it takes the entities. You're starting to see a recurring pattern here. So what do we want to do here? Well, we want to figure out if it's the correct ID because we can add timers with different IDs that have different intervals for doing different things. Right now we only have one, but we still need to check that it's the right one. So let's do a case and the ID is actually stored in the screen parameter so we pull it out of the screen parameter and if it's spawn apple then what do we want to do then we want to call our, our helper function spawn apple but we, we as with all of these we pass in entities and we return the manipulated list of entities so we can just conj 
entities with this spawn an apple. So it should just add an apple to the list of entities. Looks good. So we have our helper function. We're adding the timer just once in the on show. Remember, this just gets called once. And then we have our apple there. So let's reevaluate all of that. Nope. Runtime unable to resolve symbol texture in this context. Oh, I'm just going to have a typo. Let's try that again. Everything compiles. Flip back to the game. Push R. Does an apple appear? Yes. Look at that. There's an apple. Randomly appearing apples. Perfect. So now we want to be able to pick up the apples. One way we can do that is by adding hitboxes to both our apple and our cow. So how we add hitboxes? Well, let's write a helper function that's called call it add hitbox. As good as anything. Maybe update hitbox is better because we're going to be calling this every time that the player moves. Update hitbox. And that is going to take an entity. And what are we going to do here? So we don't want to update the hitbox if the entity is the background. We just want to do it if it's the player or the apple. So let's do the same destructuring that we did before. And let's pull out both player and apple keys. We haven't added the apple key yet to the apple, but we'll do that in a second. And again, we're probably going to want to refer to the entity. So now when we spawn an apple, we also want to add a new key value pair that says, is this an apple? Yes, it is. Okay, so if it's a player, or we should do an or, so if it's a player or an apple, then we run this code. So what do we want to do? We want to add a rectangle uh, to, the, to the map, to the entity. So how are we going to do that? We can just do an sock as before. To the entity and we're going to call it should we call it hitbox yeah let's call it hitbox so we could call it rectangle but hitbox is a bit more descriptive and let's create a rectangle we haven't pulled in the math library so let's go ahead and do that play clj dot math refer all then we'll have access to rectangle and rectangle takes four parameters x y width and height uh, we can just pull those straight out of the entity. So let's pull x out of the entity, y out of the entity, width out of the entity, and height out of the entity. And then we've created a hitbox and put it on our player. What do we do if if it's not a player? If it's a background, then like always, we just do a straight pass through. Okay, so now we need to call this. When should we call this update hitbox? Well, one way we could do it is change the move player because it, it doesn't. We could update the hitbox on every frame, but really it only makes sense to update it when we've actually moved the player. Oh, there goes the bell. Uh, my screen has gone dark, and now I'm on my break. So that's how far we got in 25 minutes. I'm actually going to stop that break and uh, carry on coding. Oh, why is it not gone back to bright? Hang on a second. Just switch the how do I get my screen back to being bright? There, start. Okay, we start another Pomodoro, that's fine. So we didn't get all the way to the end in 25 minutes, but we got pretty far. Oh, they're still spawning apples. So let's carry on. Uh so what was I saying? Yes. So instead of just uh mapping this update player position over the entities, we can also map the uh, new update hitbox. And instead of doing it like this, what we can do is use a nice little uh, pattern that I actually have seen in a couple of Zach's example games, which uses the thread last macro to give you really nice access to the entities and entity. So what we do is we take the entity and then we create a map function that takes an entity. And then we can even do a thread last there and take the entity and then call the methods that are interested in individual entities. So in this case, that is, oops, I forgot. Okay, so update player position we still want to do, but we also want to do update hitbox. And let's pull these back so we have standard closure code. 
Great. So, so what? Did, let me explain this pattern just quickly. So basically, it's a way of uh, saying which functions do I have that care about entities that take an individual entity. So you see, both update hitbox takes an entity and update player position takes an entity. And this this enables me to whenever I have a new function that takes an entity, I can just add it to this list here. Whenever I have a function that takes a list of entities, I can add it to this list here. So that's a really nice uh, pattern that I think you'll be using a lot. Okay, so now we have hitboxes. Should we see if this is working? Let's compile everything. Unable to resolve symbol update hitbox, of course, because I put it after. So let's grab that and move it above. Paste. Okay, no errors. Everything seems to be compiling. Let's go back to the game, reset. Okay, so we have an apple, two apples. If we go back now and take a look at the game state, if we evaluate this, do we have hitboxes? Apple, true, height, width. No, we don't seem to have a hitbox there. What have I missed? So I'm calling update hitbox only when we move the player, of course. So let's move the player. And now let's check out. Now we have hitboxes. Perfect. Just what we were hoping for. So what do we do with these hitboxes? Well, now we need to figure out if the player is touching one of the apples, we want to remove it. So let's add a new helper function called remove touch apple. Whoa, that isn't where I wanted to do it. There. Fn remove touched apples. Well, and this one is actually going to take a list of entities, not an individual entity, because we want to check all of the apples at once. Uh, so this, when we call this function, it's actually going to live. I can do that straight away. We're going to call it down here because that's part we want to pass that entities, not entity. So remove touched apples. Perfect. So how do we do this? So we want to first let's grab all the apples. Apples. How are we going to do that? So we have a list of entities and we can just do a filter, can't we? We can just say filter, do an anonymous function and just say, does the entity that we're currently looking at contain apple? If it does, then it's an apple and we want it. So with entities, so that will give us all our apples. And then we want the player. Oh, but hang on a minute. At the start of the game, we don't have any apples. And if the player has eaten all the apples, we won't have any apples. So it's possible that that's going to be nil. So let's do an if let. So if we have any apples, then we're going to do the check. Okay. And then let's do a let for the player. We don't need to do an if let for the player because we know we're always going to have a player. And here we could also do a filter and just do the same thing, but say, does it contain player? But that would be a little bit inefficient because that will carry on searching through the entire vector of entities, even if the player is the first entry. So what we can instead use is sum. If you look at the document, the docs for sum, it says return the first logical true value of predex for any x in collection. And that's exactly what we want. We want it to stop fast, to stop as soon as it's found what we want. So how do we do that? So if we do a when, uh, when it's a player across the entities. Does that look right? Yeah, I think that's right. So sum, grab the first one when this predicate is true. So when the player exists in the entity, grab that, grab that entity and set it there. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so now we have the apples, we have the player. So let's figure out which apples are touched. So let's calculate the touched apples. And because we already have the list of apples, we can just filter that list and figure out which ones are touched. Uh, so let's do an anonymous function and we can use the rectangle instead of creating a rectangle like before with the texture we can say we ha I already have an existing rectangle on it and I want to call a, a function on it and which rectangle do we want to call so let's grab the, the rectangle out of the player and we didn't call it rectangle we call it hitbox so let's grab that out of the player and which function do we want to call there's a function called overlaps which is really useful, which tells us, does this rectangle overlap this other rectangle? So let's grab the hitbox out of the apple. Uh, because we're going to be filtering over the list of apples, we can do it like that. And then just say apples like that. That looks, I think that's right. So we check 
is that the hitbox of the player overlapping the hitbox of the apple and we're grabbing it out of this, this list of apples that we've created here that we've filtered. So that should give us all of our touched apples. Great. So now we have our player, we have our touched apples. Now all we need to do is get rid of the touched ones. We just want to remove them from the collection. And remove works on set. So let's set the touched apples from entities. I think that should do it. And then if we didn't find any, if this it let, if this apples is null, then uh, this if let will fail, which means we should just do what we always do, pass through unmolested entities. Okay, remove touched apples. Grab the apples, grab the player, filter out the apples based on which ones are overlapping, remove them from the list of entities, we'll just return. That looks pretty good. Let's see if it compiles. It seems to compile. Let's try it in the game. We'll do a reset. Look, I'm picking up the apples. We have our basic game. Uh, not super complicated, not super fun even, but uh, it, it is a game. It has entities, it has interaction. Hopefully you found this a good stepping stone from going from the tutorial to the more complicated example games that Zach has written. And uh, yeah, it's not too much code. How much code is the entire game? 79 lines of code, including white space. And I know you shouldn't measure code on just how many lines of code it is, it's possible to, you know, just cram all this on one line and say, look how little code it is, but uh, I've actually tried to, to write it in, in a clear and readable way, and I, I'm pretty pleased with, with how it's turned out, and uh, hopefully you've learned something, and hopefully you'll, you'll go out and try play a CLJ and build some super cool games, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you build. Thanks a lot for watching this screencast. Goodbye.